All right, so welcome back, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Henrik Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson has a PhD in model-based development and works at uh, Saab Aeronautics. He has significant experience in a wide range of uh, application domains, including power plant development, flight control engineering, and uh, several other CPS-related areas. His interests uh, focus on <coughs> modeling, simulation, project management, and also change management. So a wide range of uh, different uh, interests and expertise. Um, he has also recently started his own consulting firm called NVIN, standing for Environment and Innovation, but also in Swedish sounds like a win. Yeah. So on that note, welcome Henrik. And uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and uh, it would be a great pleasure for me to talk to you. I hope you will do the same. <coughs> so first, I will just uh, a short introduction of me, myself, and the Saab where I work. Thank you. So session one is one. We will talk about the uh, introduction and present the uh, Saab, as I said. Then we will talk about uh, large scale. Modeling and simulation, what do we mean by large scale? Tomorrow, no, uh, today also, session two uh, is about more about systems engineering and I'll talk about complexity dependencies and uh, what happens when we scale up uh, uh, the product development. Tomorrow, I will talk more about reuse, reuse of models and uh, how to do it in a fashion so we can uh, have a product family product line of, of models. If, we get, if I have time, I will also talk a little bit about change management. I mean, often we have a goal we want to reach. We think about uh, when we are finished with uh, introducing model based or something, but the travel from where we are to getting there is a huge change management effort often. I hope I will uh, uh, have time to cover that also. So, I actually worked with agriculture for several years and then I did my master in control engineering. So I'm a control engineer. I worked for a ABB company doing power plants for some years. And it was all about modeling and simulation. And now uh, 19 years within Saab, flight control engineering, systems engineering. Uh, I did my <coughs> PhD study as an industrial PhD student. So it was a fantastic opportunity to work at the same time as I did my PhD. And protein change management, as I said. So this is how I allocate my, uh, this uh, task to my limited resources. That's about systems engineering to actually uh, use the resources in an efficient way. Uh, Saab, we have developed uh, aircraft since uh, 37. Uh, and now we have several, four, more than 45 years, and we have uh, produced more than 4,000 aircraft. Uh, and the program I've been working in mostly is the Gripen aircraft. Uh, 1990, the Swedish Air Force uh, started to use the, the first version of the Gripen aircraft. And now we have South Africa, Hungary, the Czech Republic, UK, Thailand, and very proudly right now we are working with the Brazil, Brazilian Air Force to do a version or a variant of the new, new generation of uh, Gripen. It actually, f the first test aircraft in this uh, version is flown just one month ago, so we are just in the very early stages to, uh, to make that uh, version uh, operational. So, let's go into the morning pouch. Please uh, ask questions as I go along. It's just whatever you feel. So what is the problem we want to solve? Anyone? What is the problem we want to solve with uh, doing modeling and simulation, basically? 
detect problems before they occur. Yeah, it's good. What do we obtain by that? I said that we save a lot of fuel. This illustrates that uh, uh, we save fuel because we don't have to fly as much because we do a lot of the uh, product development on the ground. We uh, test and verify things on the ground instead of in the air as we did earlier. So it's maybe an environmental thing also, but uh, the thing is that we can <coughs> have a more mature product when we get up in the air. So what is MBSC to us? Why do we use it? Uh, and then in the Gripen program, mainly. And what happens when we scale up? What would we mean with large scale and what uh, uh, problems or challenges do we do we see there in the summary? So this maybe is a picture of the of the, the, the view of the cyber physical system where we have the the physical system with all the physical constraints and the physical behaviors. Uh, we have the embedded controllers with the software tasks. Um, and it's very different how to model the, the physical parts from the uh, software or control parts. Uh, but the thing is when we connect it and have the closed loop, we really can do the verification of the, the whole system. Uh, and here we use different modeling techniques as we will talk more about, but the challenge is to connect those uh, techniques together is, is a challenge. Uh, in my world, the actuators and the sensors, they are the interfaces betw between those two worlds. So you also have to consider how to model the actuators and the sensors. Is it, is it best to do it in this fashion or in that fashion? And that depends on. So, a little bit more theoretical. Uh, we have a system. In system theory, a system consists of software, hardware, and some kind of human int interaction. So that's the main kind of models we can have, a uh, kind of uh, system breakdown we can have. The model, of course, should represent the system. Uh, and to be able to scale up, it's good if the model also consists, uh, have the same structure, same architecture as the system. So the model should also consist of models of the hardware, models of the software, and other models of the human interaction. Here the thing is that usually the software, it could be the same software as, as is embedded in the, in the product. So it depends what, uh, why do you simulate and so on, why the model, the software could be actually the same thing. But for the hardware, when you simulate, it's uh, usually almost always uh, some kind of model. Of course, for the, for the computers, uh, we can use I mean the, the ECUs. We can also use the real hardware, so we have a mix of models and, uh, and hardware in the, in the simulators, for example. So what is the model about? What, what do you use it for? We say that the model. M is a model of S, the system, if M can answer questions about S. If we cannot get any answers from M, it's not a good model. So the purpose of the model should be to answer some kind of questions. And that's sometimes uh, tricky, because in the large scale we say that we should model everything, and sometimes we do models, but they are not really useful because uh, we really don't know why we do them or, or how we should do them in the best way. Uh, so another, another kind of um, view on the modeling. <coughs> we say that we have a, you, you remember the S-curve yesterday from Martin? He said that we have some kind of uh, invention or uh, um, idea what we want to build. And we, this is some kind of maturity of the product or the system. This line is the, is the model-based way of doing things, and this is the traditional, more document-oriented way of doing things. So we start by a formal definition, some kind of 
early documentation. But then we start to do models, we can simulate, we can analyze them when we go this track. Uh, so we learn, we have more knowledge about the system earlier. And when we de uh, def uh, detect the uh, defects, discover the defects, it could be requirements that are wrong, it could be design that is not very good, or it could be something else. So we do it earlier when we have more knowledge and we have good models. But the thing is, if we use those models all, all the way up to usage and <coughs> deployment of the product, we can also use the same models during the usage. So in our case, the pilots, they have training simulators. So we use the same kind of models that we develop early to understand the problem and to verify the solutions, use, reuse them in the late stages and also sell them together with our training simulators to, to the customers. So then we have a very good accuracy in the training simulators and the pilots can do almost the same things in the, in, on the ground in the training simulator as in the real aircraft. So then we save fuel during <coughs> our own fuel tests and we save fuel in the operation of the aircraft because the pilots can do a lot of training on the ground. It sounds logical to you or? Yeah. Um, so models, we can have a lot of usage of the models. So one point on this is the insight, we get our own insight when we sit with the, the desktop or we do uh, some kind of analysis. We understand, we get a deeper insight of the problem or, or of the uh, design. You can use the models to collaborate, communicate and have a, a, a shared view of the system. Uh, but also, when we have good languages, that are understandable for both the, the humans and for the, in the computers. We can do the data storage analysis, simulations or transformation. For example, uh, transform a software model to software code, uh, code generation. And then back again to have a better understanding and to integrate several models maybe. So we. When we use the models, the model-based systems and the nearing methods that are good for all those three uh, views, we get a really good uh, model-based systems and nearing methodology. And that is not easy when we scale up because uh, there are a lot of different uh, uh, viewpoints and the tools and the techniques are not so general or so specific, specific so they cover everything. So now I would like you to have a small discussion. So when we say, when we do large scale development, compared to some kind of smaller scale of course then, uh, what are the main challenges? What are the main challenges that arise when we do large scale development? By large scale I mean we can do it in different sites around the world for example. We have a lot of different disciplines, engineering disciplines, together. Uh, a lot of people, of, of course, and a lot of uh, requirements and uh, stakeholder uh, uh, viewpoints and so on. So, give two examples of challenges, at least, at least two examples of challenges that arise when we do large-scale development. You are very... <coughs> You work with a down in the corner. <laughs> 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 uh, you have some suggestions here? What is or are, are typical challenges? So I think we pointed out integration as one. Integration, integration is very good. I don't write it down here, but in integration is of course uh, something that arises when you have a large scale, yes. Communication, yes. 
And you? I think we have three, if I remember. One was coordination and communication among different teams. Yeah. Uh, development in a modular fashion, how to uh, kind of decompose the system. Yeah, the modularity, decomposition, uh, yes, yes. And also checking for consistency of different artifacts. Uh, mm. Hmm? Verification of their problem. Hmm? Good, thank you. And here? Uh, basically, different phases of development uses uh, sometimes different tools. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for example, for the control design, uh, someone may use uh, Simulink, for example, uh, in, a, in a company. Or uh, <coughs> the same uh, design phase, uh, the con con computer engineer may use uh, different uh, tools. So when, when, when you try to create a, a model for both aspects, so the tools uh, incompatibility sometimes. In, yes. Sir. So, so communication um, between, between tools. tools, yeah. Mm. Also, the second aspect uh, is um, uh, uh, goes on the in integration side. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, also uh, due to the uh, the traceability problem, so the bug <coughs> or the defect happens in the requirement. Mm. It's uh, traced till the end. Mm. So you just try to find only in the integration time mm. that, uh, and then this is too late to fix the problem. So, so mainly this is because uh, the mm. propagation of errors. Mm. Uh, so somehow I feel this has happened naturally. Yeah, in the large scale, I think it takes longer time to go from the initial requirements in in until you test it. So, exactly. so the time span is also something that makes it more complicated sometimes. Yeah. You, you have new people coming in on the yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't think I go to every group. What did you say down in the corner? Uh, so, so we mentioned uh, also integration and personnel change. Um, organization, so hierarchical or flat, mm -hmm. which one is the most suitable that can be very challenging. Yeah. Uh, models can be very large and complex and hard to manage. Trusting the model and the results and uh, computing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, somebody else that has some clues? Yeah? Uh, one interesting thing that came up here was uh, the sheer size of the group next door makes them look more dependable than they might actually be. Yeah, okay. So there's a false sense of security associated with having a big group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're good. Good, thank you. Uh, we talked about testing the model, especially in the large scale. Mm -hmm. So, testing, error, mm -hmm. correction. Yep, one testing one and, and also to put things together and test them together, so the integration. Uh, because also, yeah. it needs maybe uh, many resources. And mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, many resources, <laughs> of course. Okay, um, so we'll stop there. Um, if I should say two things that I think is more challenging is the first is communication and the second is communication <laughs> actually <laughs> I mean that is if you do a root course analysis and say what oh shit what happened here usually it is some kind of misunderstanding <coughs> or misinterpretation or something like that I mean it could be communication as you said between tools or between uh, things in some way but that depends usually on misunderstanding on the human side so communication between people I should say is the most challenging thing when you scale up uh, and it's due to that we have different languages of course we speak different languages we have, we have development around the world so it's difficult to have the same uh, of course we use English but maybe not really use the same kind of English if we misunderstand each other and when it comes to modeling languages it's a lot of them and uh, they are also of course uh, can do mis uh, misunderstandings and uh, errors in, in, in the modeling languages so communication and and to have communication we need languages and I will come back a little bit more to the to come I mean we have we need languages for specific problems, purposes, but we should need some kind of language to 
that we all speak, that we can all uh, use together. And as I would say, there are no such uh, good language today for systems engineering or for uh, super physical systems uh, widely. So I will go in a little bit more about uh, for different languages and different domains. So we use, of course, a lot of different tools. Uh, this is a Modelica model that we typically use for the physical part of the system. This is a Simulink model that we usually use for the for the software part to model the software and, and uh, generate code. And this is a graphical model for the for the user interface in the, in the aircraft. Uh, so we have uh, defined modeling domains. Modeling domains is uh, some kind of uh, one one domain is some kind of common uh, language for that kind of uh, engineering domain. So if you start here, we have the structure where we do the CAD models. It's very spatial. I mean, you have X, Y, Z, and so on, and you, you do. And here we have add the weight, and we do the uh, stress analysis. So the physical systems is more about the engines and the pumps and the, the fluids that we typically do simulation in, in Modelica and such. And the electronic and electronic parts, that is very similar physically, but it's for smaller parts. And at Saab Aeronautics, we don't do that because we buy all the electronics from uh, sub suppliers. So we are not really good in, in doing the analysis of those parts. So this is a phys physical parts, more uh, in the logical domain, we have the control engineering, the classical control engineering, when we go from a time domain to a frequency domain, for example, we do the closed loop uh, design. Um, we have the information domain with uh, uh, typically the object orientation and the object oriented analysis and, and, and design. Uh, and the virtual kind of modeling, we do the HMI and so on. But also we have domain, modeling domain, we call it, where we do the, the architecture interfaces and also model the usage and needs. These are more orthogonal to, to the other ones. And something I worked very much is to do the model integration and, and system simulation, where we collect models from a lot of different domains and put them together and make the large scale simulation of the whole product at the same time. And then is the, the challenge because some of the models could be really heavy. So it could be really heavy to do, to run the simulation when we have heavy models from uh, different domains. So here is a balance also how accurate or how, how uh, specific should the models be. So I will go through some of those uh, modeling domains a little bit more. So the classical control engineering, and this is my home because I'm a control engineer from the beginning. So here's the MATLAB Simulink uh, kind of modeling. And here we usually use uh, the caution models and ordinary differ differential equations as the base. Uh, so we try to get the closed loop view. And this is signal flow oriented. So it's, uh, it's uh, one direction, like you said, input. We have inputs everywhere. Um, and we can do the, the transformation, for example, and do a lot of uh, analysis and uh, robustness tests and everything like that. Uh, the physical systems domain, uh, there we use Modelica, and we are very proud of Modelica because it's developed in, in Linköping, where I'm from. So. Uh, we use it a lot and uh, we have a good collaboration with the university so we can get uh, we have research programs there. Um, and it's uh, nice because Modelica is widely spread now in, in automotive industry, for example. And we use the Dumola tool that is uh, it's also from Sweden, I think, from be the beginning, from Lund, as I understand. Uh, and this is based on the, it's, it's non-causal and it's based on the differential. We, we can use the differential uh, algebraic equations that is very powerful. It's powerful because we don't need to 
design the, the causality. We can have input outputs in the, in the same time, so to say. So it's balancing, it's, it's solving the equa a big equation every time step. So we don't have to decide what is input and what is output. So it's a typical, you, you write the equations in, in the declarative format. Uh, the drawback is it could be difficult to to debug such a program to understand where to find the, the errors if, if it doesn't work. And we use it for energy flow and for <coughs> it's called power port technique when you have the the non causal uh, connections. And for the architecture, that's more the, the holistic view. Uh, and we use SysML. Do you know about SysML? Systems Modeling Language. Uh, it's based on the UML, U, uh, language from the beginning. Uh, some people like it and some don't like it very much. Um, we use it because there is not really a good alternative on the market today. Uh, and we, but we have to limit it. We have to say that we use only these parts of SysML because it's, it's very broad. So we have to, to make our own profile to make it work in, in our environment. And typically we define a system, we say what's in, <coughs> what parts does the system cons consist of, what is the boundary, what is the environment to the system, and what are the, the interfaces, the ports. So it's a kind of top-level architecture. Um, and here it's also important that we should use SysML to describe the different views, the different views of the system to, to make analysis of those viewpoints. I will talk more about that in, in my second session, about the views and the viewpoints. Um, because that, that's also a trick when we have large scale. So a little bit more about the, the large scale development. Uh, you know the ele elephant uh, fairy tale says that um, I cannot, uh, <laughs> I don't <laughs> recognize it, ever, but it seeks blind men, as I, as I remember, that uh, finds an elephant and they say, what is this? This one, he feels something very sharp and uh, hard here. Uh, this one is it's very soft and warm and so on. And they cannot agree on what, what is it actually they have found. Uh, and that is typically also for engineering. We have different aspects. We see different parts of the product. And we are uh, hard to, to see the holistic view, the whole We cannot see the elephant. Uh, so the, mod the models, they should help us to have a common picture of the, of the whole system. So we need really to have a common and shared view so we understand what is the, what is the shit about the system we have to, uh, to produce here. What are the needs from the customers so we have a common understanding of that. Uh, and then we need some kind of, of uh, modeling uh, language for that. So the model, it has to be partial, it can contain everything. We need, we need it to have parts of the system and it should be for certain purposes. And one purpose is of course to understand the, the needs for, for the customers. Uh, it also has to be abstract in, in some way. Uh, if it's not abstract, it contains too, too much information, so it's hard to handle. And it has to be cognitive in, in some way also. So typically, when, what we do is that we have a view that is the functional view. We have the functions of the system in a function, uh, function overview. So this is the main function. It's divided into sub-functions, so we can understand what, what, is the, what should the system do. And then we have the composition. Here we used the block definition diagram in SysML to 
decomp uh, do the com decomposition of the system and the subsystems, and also we can decompose uh, the, the environment. And then we have the activities and the state diagrams to understand what happens when the system is running, with the startup and a sunny day running and uh, shut down, and but also the, the failure modes in aircraft development is very important to to use the failure analysis and understand what happens. How should we handle the hazards or the the problems that occur? So these three views are very important. The capability or function of the system, the form or the, the structure, the, the composition, and the behavior or uh, allocation of, of uh, functions to, to parts. So these are typical things that always are included in our system model, top-level system model. Uh, and in that <coughs> I will talk about more specific views that we could use also, that we can use the information in the model to do analysis of specific viewpoints, security or safety or uh, other things. Uh, of course, we could use these for uh, example uh, calculate the weight of the aircraft. But it's not done in this kind of model. There we use the CATIA models and we transfer, uh, we collect information about the weight there. But we can have a lot of different, we could have a lot of different views additionally in this kind of model also. So, in summary, we said that Communication is important. Model-based systems engineering is uh, one way to solve the large-scale problem. If we understand each other, we have a common understanding, both in the holistic view, but also for parts. We use some kind of, of uh, languages so we can understand each other. The languages are good so we can uh, also analyze and transform and store and so uh, and further on. In our computers we can do simulation both in desktop simulations but also in test rigs and so on. So we can understand the system and the problems and do analysis and we can explain those to our colleagues and we can use uh, good notations. Then we get a really good uh, uh, development environment. And something is, is about the languages, because we, as I said, we cannot only use one language. Uh, we also have something called XTUML, uh, executable, executable Transformer UML. Have you heard of that? Someone has worked with that? It's the subset of UML that is very restricted, so it, it's uh, easy to do uh, transformation. What type of transformation? Transformation to from model to code. Oh, okay. mm. uh, and of course, MATLAB Simulink. It, it's not the standard, but it's uh, more like a de facto standard that uh, every uh, everyone is using in in the aircraft and automotive industries. Uh, Modelica. Um, and I will mention one one thing that we have worked in. Uh, research project 10 years ago that we that we use now that is called the hosted simulation for a physic cyber physical system with a, a physical part and a logical part we use model <laughs> for the physical and MATLAB for the software part um, and to connect those two we can do it by connecting the tools but then we need to have an infrastructure we have the licenses and we have a lot of things it's very tricky so we instead we do like we uh, generate code from Simulink and put that piece of code like a, as a black box in the Modelica model, so we can run them together and the uh, hardware engineer, so to say, uh, can analyze the hardware and the controller is just like a black box. And then we do the vice versa. We generate code from Modelica from the demo tool and put it like a black box in, in our Simulink model so we can analyze from the other aspect. Co-simulation. Co 
it's actually called hosted simulation because co-simulation then, uh, as I understand, we run the, the tools simultaneously. Yes, in this case also it's Yeah, it might be. you take a code from Modelica, yeah. put it in Simulac, mm -hmm. so even though it's a black box, it's also executing. Yeah. So both are running parallelly. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is. But in the in in the research project, we distinguish between co-simulation, where two uh, programs are running in parallel, and hosted simulation. When we we don't, we just use the license for doing code gen code generation, and then we we are not dependent on that tool anymore. So then we host the code in the other tool, so to say. So in, it's called hosted simulation. It maybe depends on the definitions, but. Uh, how we call it anyway. Um, yeah, so that's uh, my summary for this part, I think. Yeah. So, do you have any questions? I have one. Yeah. Uh, in the, from the exercise, we understand that uh, the communication is a problem. Mm. So, in SARP, uh, how do you address this problem? Uh, one way is to, to not use too many languages, because too many languages is, is a problem. But as I said, we need specific languages for, for specific things like, like those. But we try to use the SysML for, as the common language to describe the system. And of course, we also use English to, to, uh, as a communication tool. And we have courses in English and everything, so that's also a do you follow some systematic approach like life cycle management, like uh, CLM, ALM? There is mm. a concept called collaborative life cycle management, mm. wherein uh, uh, it's a concept where all the stakeholders involved, uh, it's a virtual in environment where uh, it eliminates the gap. Mm. Okay, so it's a more systematic approach. That's yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the bottom we have ISO 15288 as our standard for. Building our processes, and we try to, and we also have processes for different things to have a common understanding of how to do things in in which order to do things. Um, I think that life cycle management is included as one process area in in the ISO standard. Yeah. Yeah. So ISO fifteen two eight eight is is the basic standard, uh, but then also we need this kind of. Of languages because that that is just the framework for for uh, organizing the processes. Uh, but have, as we are an old company, we have a lot of, a lot of legacy, both legacy in in the processes how how we work, but also legacy in the in the models, for example. As we talked about, we have Fortran models from the 60s or 70s that is very hard to maintain. But uh, they have so much knowledge built in, so it's uh, difficult sometimes to, to try to build a new one because uh, they really don't work as, as, we, as the old one, and it's difficult to understand how the engineers thought at that time. So we have still some, some small uh, parts of the system that is modeled in, in Fortran. So the legacy problem is, uh, is also when we come to large scale and, and uh, life cycles that span over 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Um, so do you know about uh, ADL? Uh, do you have any experience with it? What, what this? ADL, it's like an architecture modeling language? No. AES. Uh, AADL. AADL. AADL we have uh, looked into a bit. But is that the one from uh, CMU? Yeah, yeah, CI, CI. Very short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's actually similar to OCSML. Okay. Both serve the same purpose mm -hmm. to get a holistic view mm -hmm. of the whole system. Mm -hmm. It's just an architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, CMU is a, it's a graphical notation, but mm -hmm. it's not very good semantically. So, so we have to put a lot of effort into to make it. Uh, to restrict it, to say it. this uh, block, it uh, describes this thing and so on and so on. We have a methodology, so we have a methodology group that works with uh, with uh, 
applying SysML for, for us, for our purposes. Yeah. Somebody else? Okay. Thank you.